Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on advanced microscopy of compound semiconductors. My name is Rena Samsu, marketing at Eurofins EAG Laboratories. We have Dr. Mike Salmon, scientific fellow of our advanced microscopy group presenting to you today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's events. All attendees have been muted. However, we'd still love to hear from you during today's presentation. You'll have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenter by typing your questions in the questions panel located in the bottom right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Our question moderator, Zhang Taozhu, director of TM Technologies, will be answering some of the questions during the presentation, and we will also collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's talk. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. I would now like to introduce Dr. Mike Salmon, Scientific Fellow of the Advanced Microscopy Group. Mike? Thanks, Rena. Uh, good afternoon, I guess good evening, good morning to all you out there. Thanks for joining us. Um, as Rena mentioned, today's topic will be on the microscopy of compound semiconductors. A little bit about me. Um, I I got my PhD in material science from North Carolina State University uh, with an emphasis in microscopy and surface analysis. And I've spent uh, the last 16 years here at EAG focused on highly localized characterization and failure analysis of compound semiconductors. So today's agenda, I'll go over a little bit of background about the company and some microscopy basics. Uh, we'll, I'll show some characterization examples. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about computational data analysis and defect analysis, and then combining techniques uh, to provide uh, sort of a bigger picture of what's going on within uh, an example sample. And then we'll summarize and then have some question and answers at the end. So Eurofins is a global leader in testing with more than 58,000 employees, 900 laboratories in 54 countries. Um, it's a division of EAG, Eurofins EAG is a division of uh, Eurofins specializing in materials testing with over 40 years experience. We have more than 600 employees and 20 laboratory facilities all over the world. And we have more than 2,500 different types of testing equipment and support over 4,000 different clients. So we have a wide variety of characterization, characterization techniques available to you. And these are sum summarized on this chart called the SMART chart. And the SMART is an acronym for Spectroscopy Microscopy Analytical Resolution Tool. And it shows these techniques that we have here at EAG that are avail available to you. Uh, this chart allows us to compare the spot size and detection limit of each of the techniques. And the techniques are color coded according to the descriptions at the lower left. For example, dark blue areas provide elemental information primarily, while green shows imaging information. Um, the x-axis shows the range of spot sizes from one centimeter at the right down to one angstrom at the far left. And the y-axis shows concentrations, either in atoms per cubic centimeter at the left or in atomic concentrations at the right that range from 100% at the top down to 10 parts per trillion at the bottom. So within the box, you can select your technique based on the detection limit you need and the size of your area of interest. And then outside this box are techniques that don't quite belong in the chart itself. These are techniques on the right, for example, that don't necessarily have a spot size associated with them. They are basically bulk composition techniques that may consume your entire sample, and they have the detection range shown from top to bottom. The techniques at the bottom are basically imaging techniques and don't provide compositions per se, but they do have relevance uh, with respect to the spot size on the x-axis. And an interactive version of this chart can be found at our website, uh, www.eag.com techniques. And I, I welcome you to, to check that out. Definitely can be very helpful in trying to understand and determine what technique you might need um, for your, your specific analysis. And another useful chart that the EAG has created shows the depth of analysis of each technique. So things like TOF SIMs have very shallow sampling depth of only one nanometer, um, while XPS and OJ are a little greater at 10. And the surface analysis techniques are up to a thousand times shallower than routinely used analytical techniques like FTIR or SEM-EDS. 
So this means that uh, very thin films or contaminants can be detected on a sample by TOF, SIMS, or XPS, or OJ that might be missed by other techniques like EDS. Um, the arrows indicate that deeper depths are available in some techniques through depth profiling, and depth profiling is just the removal of the sample material by ion beam sputtering, so things like SIMS, for instance, where we're physically removing material and analyzing it down through the depth of the sample. So that gets us to compound semiconductors and how to, you know, what, what are compound semiconductors? All of you probably are well versed in this, but just to, you know, go over it. So we're, compound semiconductors are single crystal materials that are comprised of two or more elements, um, uh, typically of these uh, particular groups in the periodic table. So we have two six, three fives, and four fours. Um, they're highly tailorable materials uh, as far as their electrical and optical properties go, and they're, they're going to do this through uh, various alloying and layering of the uh, different material, like through heterepitaxy, for instance. So there are a, a quite a different set of issues faced by compound semiconductor characterization than for uh, simply silicon or germanium, in the sense that we, we uh, really need to be able to analyze and understand uh, the composition, crystal quality, interfaces, et cetera, because, because the people that are making these materials need very precise control of these to effectively control the optical and electrical properties they're uh, hoping to attain. And so this is a chart just showing common uh, microscopy techniques we use for these kinds of these kinds of analyses. And essentially we use this concept of digging down. So uh, here at the top, we use optical techniques to, to look at larger, larger fields of view, and then we progressively use things like electron microscopy and focused ion beam to then be able to eventually uh, get down to atoms or sub-angstrom type resolutions for analysis. And so here in the middle, we have some practical resolutions for each of the techniques where optical gets you to about a quarter of a micron spatial resolution. SEM can get you down to a nanometer or maybe a little bit better than that now with the best SEMs. And then if we need to get down to the atomic scale, we'll use something called spherical aberration corrected uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy or AC stem for short. And that gets us down to the sub-angstrom regimes. And so just to go over a little bit of the basics about uh, electron microscopy techniques, the first the first major one is scanning electron microscope or SEM. And so the idea here is we're gonna use a focus probe of electrons anywhere from about 500 EV to 30 KV. And we're gonna, and then raster that across the sample surface. And those high energy electrons are gonna interact with the sample and then create a variety of different signals that we can then monitor with a variety of different detectors. So now we can plot out how intensity changes for each of these signals. Uh, spatially over the surface of a sample. And so SEM has some advantages as well because it has much greater depth of focus than optical imaging. So we can get real sense of 3D kind of sense of our samples as well. And uh, basically provides the, the background for doing a non-destructive type of uh, imaging of our samples. So the second technique is going to be focused ion beam. So we're going to use ions as our probe at this point. And so we can use this to actually physically change our sample in a way that we want to. And the FIB system has three main functions. We have the ability to deposit materials, actually. We can introduce a precursor gas, such as carbon or platinum containing organometallic. And where we raster the ion beam on the surface, we can actually deposit this film. We can do these similar things too in the electron beam as well, but ultimately this is where we add these much thicker protective layers for further uh, work like cross-sectioning, et cetera. The second regime is sputtering. So we're gonna physically remove material from the sample uh, using uh, ions uh, projected at the sample. And so here we can make things like cross-sections or plan view samples. And then thirdly, we can actually use it to image as well, which provides some very interesting uh, contrast, especially for, for metals or polycrystalline metal kind of samples. So if we're interested in looking at grain structure, et cetera, we can maybe even image. So we usually use very low currents at this point and collect the secondary uh, electrons that are created by that ion beam interaction with the sample. So one thing to think about here is we need to 
optimize the beam conditions um, for each of these different functions, as well as the different materials that we then are working with. So compound semiconductor materials, a lot of them have a very wide variety of interactions with the ion beam. And, and so it usually takes quite a bit of time to optimize for, for making samples that are uh, fairly uh, defect free from the sample prep itself. So one thing to think about is for typically we're using gallium as the main uh, ion for fib. We can also, there's also a, a technique called plasma fib where we use a, a plasma source, which allows us to do much bigger areas, so much higher currents. But typical size of gallium prep fib samples in cross section for SEM are approximately like 30 microns wide by 10 microns tall, something like that. And so then that takes us to this FIB interaction with compound semiconductors. This is an example showing real time imaging as we mill through a Vixel DVR structure. So, this is gas and al gas alternating layers that are about 100 nanometers thick. And what we're seeing here is actually the pooling of the gallium metal from the sample. Um, on the surface. And so you, you see as we go through the different layers that contain more gallium or less gallium, we see the increase and decrease of these gallium droplets and some sort of Oswald ripening type uh, scenario here where now you can see we have a lot more uh, gallium. And then this happens because gallium has a very low melting point and we're imparting enough energy in the sample at this area to actually give enough energy for the gallium to move around on the surface. So we can manage these effects by changing the, the beam conditions of the FIB and, and, and typically we can find optimal settings for given materials, but for some more extreme situations, so this happens in indium phosphide as well where you see a lot of indium actually moving on the surface. For more extreme situations, we can, we can use cryo FIB now. So we actually have cryo stages for our our fibs and dual beams that allow us to be able to, to mill at much colder temperatures if that's of interest of you. And so then that takes us to the, the sort of the merging of the two into a tool called the dual beam. And so this is the primary tool that we use for all our sample prep um, at, e, at EAG for both SEM and uh, for STEM, especially for compound semiconductor materials. So a lot of times the compound materials are integrated into uh, packages with other much much harder or softer materials, which made it make it very very difficult to do mechanical cross sectioning, and, and a lot of times the compound materials are very brittle, so you can actually they break very easily under mechanical uh, cross section conditions. So we typically utilize the focused ion beam for making these precise uh, cross sections, so that we don't impart any of that mechanical stress on the sample. So the dual beam's been around quite a long time now, since the 90s, and essentially we're going to use the SEM to, to monitor uh, in a non-destructive way what we're doing with the ion beam. And like I mentioned, we've, we, we use gallium primarily, but we also have access to plasma fib as well, and this allows us to do very precise cross-sectioning, and we're using this almost exclusively now for compound work. And so just to get an idea, uh, when we do dual beam cross sections here, so we remove material using the ion beam, uh, we initially uh, deposit a protective cap on the surface to protect the material below it, and then we remove that material and then observe with the electron beam. And this is sort of our typical cross sectional view viewing area. And this is an example of a typical cross section we would make that's tens of microns wide here of a uh, GAN hemp structure, for instance, and this allows us to investigate, uh, you know, the topology, the composition differences in the overall structure. We can see, we can readily see the GAN layer on the sapphire. Uh, we can see the source, drain, and gate regions and the field plates, et cetera. And it gives us an idea of, uh, of information about, let's say, even metals in the gate that might be diffusing together, together things like that. And we can make measurements gross measurements of this structure with you know ten tens of nanometer precision fairly easily. So now if we want to know what the elements that are present, we can do a technique called EDS or X-ray analysis. So here, as we were mentioning, the electron beam interacts with this the sample and we knock out some inner shell uh, electrons and then other higher energy electro electrons drop down to fill in these inner inner shell 
electrons and give rise to characteristic X-ray um, X-rays being emanated from the sample. And so we can use a spectrometer to actually collect those uh, different X-rays. And so they, they can get plotted here. So this is like counts or numbers per energy. And so then with that, we can actually, uh, we can create little energy windows and color code them, for instance, and then do mapping. So as we collect uh, or as we scan the sample, we collect a spectrum at each of these pixels, and then we can then plot those energy windows to then understand how uh, these composition changes spatially over the sample. And so this is a form of hyperspectral imaging. And, and from that data set, we can also extract specific spectra from certain areas here in the, in the silicon nitride passivation or over here in the aluminum uh, drain contact, right? And so what we find is then we can then get a fingerprint of all the elements that are present here. We see that there's actually quite a variety in this one and this one. And so there actually is an element, there's an issue with crosstalk. So we're, we're trying to get this kind of data with this interaction volume going into the sample at an angle and we have to work at fairly high energies to excite these uh, X-rays. So we need to work at around 10 kV and that causes some crosstalk of the signal. And so if we need better uh, discretion, then we need to move to something like TEM or STEM. And we traditionally use scanning transmission electron microscopy or STEM for compound semiconductors because of the wide variety of signals that are available. And so this is just an example of showing how we would make an electron transparent sample uh, from, let's say, that previous uh, SEM cross section that we made. So instead, now we'll actually mill away the material on the backside. We'll physically lift the sample out of out of the bulk and place it on a, a TEM's uh, grid, is what we call it. So this is something we can manipulate with tweezers, and we'll actually. Uh, weld or we'll use the, the deposition capability to then tack the sample onto the side of this lift out post and then we'll thin a small region to electron transparency. And so one thing to remember here is that uh, lamella thickness can be very variable uh, depending on what we want to do with the sample. So um, STEM is very forgiving and, and able to generate very high quality images even from very thick samples. So uh, in a lot of cases, we're trying to track down defects in a sample, so we want to we want to actually analyze the most volume of material as we can to try to make sure we capture uh, the important defects. As these defects can be very very small, and the only way we're targeting them is oftentimes from optical techniques, which have fairly low spatial resolutions. But then when we want to get down to get really really high resolution, high quality information from the crystal itself we're gonna to need to make that sample thinner and thinner. And so for the highest quality uh, atomic level imaging, we're gonna want samples that are anywhere from five to 50 nanometers thick. And so, as I mentioned, we use STEM primarily for compound semiconductors because of the wealth of information from a single analysis and the fact that we really need uh, spatially resolved um, composition and chemical analysis. And so, as I mentioned in SEM, we have this large interaction volume in, into the sample, and this is primarily due to the scattering of the electrons within the material. So, in the case of STEM, we now use a thin sample, and so now our interaction volume is much smaller as it's only confined to the thickness of the sample itself. And then we use a variety of detectors below the sample to collect information about the interaction of those electrons with the sample. And so, from one analysis, we get all this information. So we get some compositional information, we get you know, crystalline information from diffraction and HADF imaging, as well as some bright field, and also we can get yields too. And one last thing is we have a newer detector now uh, for us, which is a, actually a, a quadrant-based uh, uh, annular detector below the sample, which then gives rise to integrated uh, differential phase contrast imaging, which can be very good uh, for looking at structure with these compound materials, which have very different uh, Z elements present. And so using STEM now on that same sample, this same uh, GAN hemp sample, this on the left is the, the SEM image that we took underneath the gate. And then this is the corresponding STEM HADF and bright field. And so now 
we can see that using STEM, we get important information about uh, both the composition changes in the sample as well as in the crystallinity or the crystal defect evolution through the cross section, which we can't readily see crystalline information in the SEM. And so we can then zoom in and get much more detail about things uh, and learn a lot more about our heteroepitaxial samples. We can investigate the buffer region here and looking at the transition from the sapphire uh, to the aluminum nitride buffer with atomic uh, resolution here. And then we can watch and look at the evolution of defects as they propagate towards the surface and the active uh, algan layer. We can actually investigate with atomic resolution uh, this upper algan layer with the two deg region, the aluminum nitride two deg region as well. And so STEM just really gives us a wealth of very high resolution, now sub nanometer uh, spatial resolutions that we can uh, characterize our samples with. And so when we were talking about getting even more information about composition using STEM, now this is the kind of mapping we can do here underneath, just as there's one corner of the gate itself. And so we can actually see that we have a, an aluminum gate with a tie nitride uh, barrier layer here. And of interest, we can then start investigating things like these very small voids in the tie nitride where we can see the aluminum is actually making it through that barrier layer down to the aluminum oxide layer just below. And we can get information in just the algan layer as well. And then that's sort of shown here to the left. So then we can start to try and understand how this composition varies maybe on a slightly more quantitative basis. So it's important to remember now that with uh, SEM EDS, you had about maybe at best 100 nanometer resolution on, a, on the best potential uh, situation. Typically it's more on the order of 500 nanometers for EDS, but now in STEM, now you can get that down to three to five nanometer spatial resolution. And you can get approximately one to two atom percent sensitivity for the majority of the elements. Uh, excluding some of the lighter elements, it's a little bit tougher. So nitrogen and oxygen and EDS are not quite as sensitive, but then we might use a technique called EELS or electron energy loss spectroscopy to look at more of the, the lighter elements. And so then that takes us to the next level. So if we wanna go even further and get even better uh, quantified data about atomic scale uh, information, we're gonna use something called aberration corrected STEM. So in this case, we use a, an extra um, lens element in the stem called uh, spherical aberration corrector. And this helps us focus all the electrons to a smaller spot. So we end up with higher beam current into a smaller spot size, which allows us for finer details. And so this is an example of an AC stem HADF image of a uh, in-GAN multi-quantum well structure from an LED. And what we can see is if we take a, a line profile through this HADF intensity and plot it here on the right, we can see that on the substrate side of the in-GAN in quantum well, we have a much more abrupt change in the composition than we do at the surface side. So now we have a way that we can actually uh, track and systematically look at changes as subtle as these very uh, turn on and turn off situations within the, the crystal structure. And it's very important to understand and be able to quantify the abruptness of these interfaces as it then relates back to the optical and electrical properties in the sample. And so another, uh, another uh, analysis that's, that utilizes this high resolution is looking at aluminum nitride polarity control, for instance. So in this case, you're starting with sapphire and we're growing aluminum nitride there we can actually use AC stem to directly image both the aluminum and the nitrogen column. So we can see uh, actually that it starts off as nitrogen polar material. And then up a little bit higher, um, they introduce some oxygen and that actually causes flipping of the polarity. And we can then directly see this flipping in the HADF image. And so it's, it's, it's this kind of discretion now that allows you know, us to provide feedback back to the growers, et cetera, about the exact structure that they're creating. In the case of GAN, HADF imaging uh, is not as successful at understanding polarity. This is an example of a lateral polar junction device in GAN. So here we have an 
<clears throat> we have an inversion domain boundary here, a vertical one. And so essentially this device operates by having PGAN on one side and NGAN on the other uh, due to differences in doping of the different polarity material. And so in the case of HADF, we really can only see clearly the gallium columns in the crystal uh, due to the Z squared sensitivity. So there's just too big a difference between gallium and nitrogen to really readily resolve this. And so we use this new technique called IDPC for inter <clears throat> integrated differential phase contrast imaging, which then has a more linear relationship to Z and allows us to readily see quite clearly the nitrogen columns as well. So here you can see on the left, we can clearly visualize nitrogen polar material or nitrogen uh, co columns are above the gallium and here on the right, it's it's reversed. And so this gives us a new ability to resolve structure on a much finer scale now, especially of dissimilar um, atoms or elements. And so using this kind of information from HADF, for instance, even IDBC isn't going to help you in the case of a quaternary. So, so previously we're talking about uh, this is just gallium nitride, so just two components, but even in ALGAN or INGAN, uh, the three fives are separated. But in the case of quaternaries, now you have a mixture of, of gallium and indium on one site, as well as potential for arsenic and, and antimony. So this is an, a case of a, uh, an alternating layer gallium antimonide and indium arsenide strain super lattice infrared detector. So Interestingly enough, there's many layers actually present here in front of you, but it's very hard to see just from the HADF image alone. And so in this case, we can actually use EDS at the atomic scale to differentiate the, the composition of each of these elements. And so this is uh, an EDS map showing very clearly where everything is in this sample, which you can't just tell from imaging alone. So IDPC isn't going to help you with this and HADF wouldn't. We really need the elemental discretion of EDS. And using AC stem with EDS, we now can actually qualitatively understand where these elements are in the structure like this. And so then that takes us to the question of like, how can we quantify things? And then how to what scale can we quantify? And so with EDS and EELS, um, we typically can get about one nanometer spatial resolutions for AC stem and, and eels. And we need to develop a strategy for actually understanding uh, where, you know, what to calibrate to. So work has been done and we found that the, the reproducibility seems to be very good um, for, for samples that we've, for instance, uh, uh, used RBS to measure beforehand. So RBS has a one plus or minus one atom percent uh, error on 5.3% indium in this INGAN layer. So it has about a 20% error to begin with. And EDS, when we do this in a standardless way, uh, we actually find that we're within this error. But at the same time, so it's, it's still going to be plus or minus 20%. But what we find is we have very good reproducibility and precision between measurements, especially if we make sure that we have enough material. So what we have to do is integrate over areas on the order of 140 nanometers squared or so. So in the case of quantum wells, we have these thinner layers. So we find that we can, we can make samples thin enough while we still retain uh, information from the layer itself, but also still have enough actual, let's say, indium in that layer to, to make fairly decent measurements from sample to sample. And so we have to be careful about measuring at the same thickness as well. And so ultimately we try to convince our clients to utilize what we call a golden sample. So their best performing sample to use that as actually the reference sample for what they wanna do. And then we do the same analysis on their additional samples and we look at changes relative to that. And so we utilize the, the, you know, the precision of the instrument more than the quant itself because Essentially, the, the AC stem EDS accuracy using standard samples is never going to be better than this one atom percent from RBS. So you're always going to be 20% or so uh, from that. But we can utilize golden samples to actually leverage the precision to be better. So back down to about plus or minus 
0.5 atom percent. So now you're talking maybe 10% uh, relative errors. And so talking about using eels as well, so instead of just looking at elemental compositions, we can look at localized uh, bonding information or localized chemistry on a, on a sort of a nanometer scale regime. This is an example where we're looking at Vixel oxide layers in uh, controlled good sample versus two different failures. And what we find is this is a typical uh, example of the oxygen eel spectra that you would get. And what we find is that there's a difference between the good and the bad samples. And so we have this unusual fine structure at 532 EV, which then, if we look through the literature, seems to uh, be potentially attributed to oxygen pi bonding. So we have a difference in the oxygen bonding locally in the failed samples versus the control. So there's more work being done uh, to create uh, the correct kind of uh, reliability testing to then feedback. So what we have is we have an ability to know that there is a difference in the local bonding in these very thin layers from sample to sample. And uh, ultimately, this is the kind of information that we can apply not only to these aperture layers, but also we can look at, let's say, interfaces between passivation layers, let's say silicon nitrides on GAN surfaces, for instance, and look at the bonding at those interfaces and see differences and details in that. And so that's the kind of information that then becomes very important because it could be what's actually dominating the performance of the device. And so from, from there, I've sort of introduced the, the electron microscopy techniques we're using to create the data. The next sort of front that we are using at EAG is, is using computational methods to you know, increase repeatability of measurements as well as to extract more data from these high resolution HADF images in particular. And so this is an example uh, showing how we can uh, do automated uh, layer measurements where we then uh, plot those thicknesses on on the, the image itself within some, some variants of the thickness measurement. And then we can also do things where we, we look at uh, intensity profiles that were taken from the HADF image itself. And then we can set up uh, specific fits using sigmoidal fits, and then we can define the thickness as some specific ratio of um, maximum intensity versus lowest intensity. In this case, it's 16 to 84%. And then we can measure each of these interfaces in the same way and come up with, uh, we can see variances in that thickness. So we're trying to take the the analyst out of the, the measurement process. And so we can also then do this in a way that generates uh, significantly more data points as well, more quickly and reproducibly. And then for non-uniform or more complicated layers, we actually are beginning to employ uh, machine learning algorithms uh, for automated feature measurement. This is an example of a, a 3D structure with some roughness in the seed layer here. And so you can see there's a lot of variance in the contrast of this layer itself. And so this would be traditionally very hard with classical techniques to isolate this layer. And so we're going to use the machine learning, which then can overcome these limitations. Um, the only the issue is that it takes some effort to train. So we have to actually help it by making initial measurements on a variety of samples and then once it gets its learning down, then it can provide us with very deep statistics. And essentially it's able, it's capable of inferring structure like we do with our human eye. And, and that is, is a real significant improvement uh, for especially routine uh, measurements over and over again at very high resolutions with varying contrasts. And so another thing of interest is trying to look in how do we look at actual lattice parameter changes in samples. This is a case of an in, in al gas multi-quantum well structure. Uh, HADF images here with overlaid EDS uh, line profiles. So looking at how the composition is actually changing. And so the growth direction is from left to right. Well, we can use a technique called GPA or geometric phase analysis um, to look at the three central quantum wells. And we choose this is a fast Fourier technique. So we can choose these two reflections and look at how 
the uh, lattice parameter changes qualitatively relative to a reference area, such as the barrier layer here. And so we find using GPA is that we can, we see that there's approximately a two and a half percent change in the out of plane lattice parameter, um, which then qualitatively agrees with the EDS itself. And then ultimately a lot of the work we're doing now is trying to understand how we can relate the EDS data that we have for these samples and then move more to quantifying the actual strain present in the sample. So GPA has some real benefits that, that it essentially can, it's very fast and can give uh, one to two nanometer spatial resolutions, but it's limited to images that have high quality uh, lattice information in it. So now you can think that uh, this might span maybe at most, you know, hundreds of nanometers to microns or so. You have to take very high, you know, pixel density images over large areas to still be able to accomplish this. And so if you needed to look at like the change in, in lattice parameter over larger regions or, or looking for strain, we would use another technique called um, precession TEM, which, which is available. And then we're also working towards uh, something called 4D STEM or the ability to actually collect uh, diffraction information at each pixel. So another hyperspectral capability, and then in which that case, then we can actually then do this sort of direct mapping from that data set. But that's still a little ways away. So the other thing we can do if we want to look even more closely is we can start making atomic scale me measurements quantitatively using this high resolution AC STEM HADF data. And so this is going to now allow us to do strain assessments, interface analysis, defect analysis. And if as we integrate over all these columns in the image, we can then find and realize errors in the mean around one picometer or a little bit less. But it's important to understand that this is limited to very small areas, about 20 to 20 nanometers, 20 by 20 nanometers, so we can handle the amount of fitting of these atomic columns, et cetera. But this really enables a, a new level of, of, of detail from our images. And so, and this is an example um, where we can utilize this lattice mapping to quantify the change in the out of plane or C axis lattice and in GAN quantum wells, uh, showing again about a 2% increase overall in the in GAN layer versus the GAN uh, next to it. And then this kind of information also helps us confirm that the that the, that the growth is still pseudomorphically strained as you go through these different compositional changes. So you can actually use this technique to figure out if, you're, if your layers are relaxing or not. And in some cases, if you're growing uh, thicker layers, that can become problematic. And then you can compare that to data that you're getting, let's say from XRD or something like that as well. And, and, and provide, this provides a little bit more you know, uh, focused detail on the specific layers. And then this really opens a lot of doors for further in-depth quantitative understandings of structure property relationships uh, eventually. And so next we want to talk a little bit about defects. And so before we're talking about measuring layers and quantifying compositions and things like that, but we can also use STEM to, to gain an understanding about defects. This is an example of looking at threading dislocations in GAN. And it's becoming more important to understand not only the total defect density, but the type as well. So either edge, screw, or mixed. And so for STEM typing, we follow the same G.B criteria that, that uh, we do in TEM routinely. But STEM uh, bright field images are, are free of bend contours and thickness fringes, giving them much more simplified contrast. And so we first take images on zone, which show all the defects, and then we take two images at appropriate tilt conditions to highlight either the screw or the edge, and then we can then we can then map out exactly where each of these is, depending on the contrast that was in the previous image. So we can see here we only have this one screw dislocation down here in the corner relative to all these, and then we get this nice robust statistics broken out by edge, screw, and mixed given the analytical area we, we got. And so understanding this kind of dislocation density is very important for the growers and the, the 
the uh, device makers as far as relating that back to device performance. And some of these may be killer defects. And so if this screw dislocation were up in the active region, this might actually be a, a potential path for shorting out the device. And we can also do this in plan view as well. So in the same way, we can then create an understanding of the dislocation density over a certain area by type as well. And so that leads us to another technique, an SEM-based technique uh, called cathode luminescence. So as I mentioned before, we have this interaction of the high energy electrons of the SEM with the sample, which gives rise to all these different signals, one of them being cathode luminescence or visible light that's emitted uh, from these semiconductors. Typically, this is direct band gap semiconductors, although it's not exclusive. Uh, and we use a specialized instrument from Adelite, which is a custom uh, instrument that has an optical uh, light collection column within the electron uh, column itself. So now we can collect uh, as much light as possible and then put that through a spectrometer and we can do hyperspectral imaging. So what can we learn from CL spectra? We basically, this is an example of showing, say, something like gallium nitride here, where you get bandage emission and then you get some types of defect related emissions. So we get changes in intensity as well as wavelength shifts, as well as full width half max of different peaks. And so we can study things like composition, strain, defect type, doping, and carrier concentration as well. And so the important thing here is that, that CL actually has much better compositional sensitivity than EDS or EELS by several orders of magnitude. So we can actually get uh, some, we can see the difference between, for instance, 1E17 silicon and GAN and, five, and 5E17 silicon and GAN pretty clearly. And so similar to the EDS and the yields that we can do hyperspectrally, we do that also with cathode luminescence. So at each pixel where we are scanning, we collect an entire spectrum of light that's being emitted from the sample. And then we can then post acquisition filter based on wavelength and create these spatially resolved maps based on wavelength. In this case, this is showing two different defect emissions. This is two different types of basal stacking faults in GAN. This one is emitting at 359 to 364. And then while the second type emits from 365 to 375. So we can use these kinds of defect emission maps to then go in and do very targeted cross-sectioning for STEM, for instance. And then this is an example where we can use ME data. So that's an optical technique for failure analysis where we can find hot spots on a GAN hemp and then make precise cross-sections at that location. And then we can do CL on this cross section. And what we find is that we get uh, a difference in the emission in this region uh, around this threading defect that's coming up through the sample. And so what we find is in this GAN hemp, they use a carbon compensated layer uh, to try to reduce the conductivity down here. And But around this defect, you actually have material that's more similar to the unintentionally doped uh, material at the top surface. And so what you're seeing here is essentially a short path through the, the sample structure. So here and there, the carbon is not being incorporated at the same rate um, around this defect as it is in the rest of the epitaxy. So the, the CL gives us a way to have this very good spatially resolved sensitivity to these very low uh, changes in composition in the, in the sample. And so then that takes us to sort of like, we can combine techniques together to get a bigger picture view of our samples. And this is an example of analyzing uh, some algan material. This is called face low or facet controlled epitaxial lateral overgrowth. And so the idea here is, is if you wanna grow high aluminum content algan on a substrate, there's no native substrates for that. And so the issue is you have a lot of stress that builds up and these, these types of layers will just crack off any substrate. So there's a, basically what we can do is we can take, for instance, GAN and first pattern a silicon dioxide mask area. So we're gonna grow up through it. We then grow this like uh, geometrically shaped uh, GAN pyramid, pyramidal, uh, let's say, shape stripes and then from there then we 
add the, alum the aluminum in and we then uh, grow that further to the surface to then where we have an area that's more defect free and we can grow the active layers for a laser, for instance. And so we can use the dual beam to actually investigate sort of the broader uh, structure of the sample. And this is uh, an example of sl using slice and view. So we're gonna cut the sample and then take a picture. Then we're gonna remove another 100 nanometers or so and take another picture. And we can watch the evolution of things like voiding and compositional changes sort of overall. This is like a 20 nanometer or 20 micron wide region. So we can kind of get a, a general overview of how this structure is in three dimensions effectively. And you can actually take this kind of data set and with uh, specialized um, 3D reconstruction um, software, reconstruct uh, the structure itself if you need to. But in this case, we're, you know, we maybe want to look even closer. So now we can make a stem prep, a cross-sectional stem prep from the same location here. Uh, to look at how the, the GAN, this is EpiGAN that's grown on a monogan substrates and then how it evolves um, through the layer structure itself with a little bit higher detail. Um, the laterally grown ALGAN starts as relatively aluminum rich uh, ALGAN here in these sort of um, the troughs in between uh, the GAN, the GAN pyramids or the ALGAN regrowth, actually first ALGAN regrowth step, and then vertically grows. So we can use STEM EDS to look at how the composition is changing here, and we can see these areas of higher aluminum content, for instance, versus the gallium content. And you see how there's this these stripes up here in the, in the HADF then correspond to uh, aluminum um, regions that are depleted in aluminum but have slightly increased gallium. So we can get an idea of these compositional differences now over maybe 10 micron area. But we can use AC stem, for instance, to look at just the active region up above here and get details about the quantum wells themselves. We can get information about the composition from EDS, for instance. We can also see how this growth decorates sort of the edge of these steps with increased gallium in the HADF images and effectively see like these widening of, of the active layers here. And so how that might then correspond to the performance or behavior of these, these lasers once they're grown. And then we can use the, the stem, especially in bright field mode to really look at the defect structure. And so in the case of the GAN, we really don't have any threading defects. We just have a lot of misfits and basal plane defects that are observed at different interfaces. And actually we find that there's a variety of them that come up this region here, this sort of central, it makes it maybe a, a pyramid inside a pyramid kind of feature, which then we can use something like CL to then investigate a bit further. So here is, the HADF image on the left, and then here's the SEMCL data in the middle. This is the hypercube that we're actually scanning through the wavelengths of. And then we can then, once again, provide these sort of colored uh, energy ranges or wavelength ranges as we go through the different aluminum contents here. And we can visualize then how the aluminum content is changing through the structure very locally with a lot more sensitivity than the EDS had, right? And so then we get here to the gallium nitride emission. And so now what we see is that in this triangular region here in the gallium nitride, the CL actually provides a lot more information about differences in that crystal uh, composition than the EDS did previously. So CL is really gonna give us that next level uh, high sensitivity, the differences in the structure and composition with spatial, um, spatial sensitivity as well. And then this leads to helping us, you know, helping inform updated growth models to the, to the folks that are making this material to really understand, okay, we have very intense vertical growth here in the center and then the lateral growth actually incorporates potentially less contaminant or more contaminants or dopant level impurities, which then gives rise to the increase in the, the cathode luminescence signal, for instance. And then we can see and watch how the growth fronts change the composition as it goes up through the sample. 
where we end up with higher increased aluminum here uh, at higher wavelength energies uh, through this structure in these mono CL maps. And, and this really then it ends up feeding back to the growers to then be able to change some conditions. And then we can then uh, you know, up, get updated structure based on that, that knowledge. So just to summarize, um, we can use SEM and dual beam to assess structure um, with nanometer resolutions and then composition um, with something like half a micron resolution. Uh, we can then move to STEM, an AC STEM with EDS or EELS to improve the spatial resolutions uh, for imaging, the sub nanometer and in some case atomic scale uh, for, for structure and then about a nanometer for uh, composition and localized uh, bonding information. And we can utilize then specialized uh, techniques like SEMCL to then extend uh, spatially resolved material sensitivity down to dopant levels, uh, especially for bit, uh, direct gap materials. And then we're gonna now apply computational data analysis techniques to help with both reproducibility as well as providing a pathway forward for quantitative lattice measurements and hopefully improving some sensitivities to, to uh, our measurement capability. And then lastly, uh, correlative microscopy really provides a more complete picture of the overall structure. So like you don't wanna get too over-focused, right? You don't wanna just do TEM a lot of times initially because you may be missing sort of the bigger picture. So like your, the homogeneity of your sample may not be a, as good as you think it is. So a lot of times it's good to start sort of with a, a zoomed out kind of view and, and, and then dig down as I've mentioned. And then last but not least, sample preparation of compound semiconductor materials is really the key to success of any uh, further analysis, either with SEM or STEM, particularly for the highest resolution work like AC STEM, where you're really trying to understand the structure and composition of a very finite small amount of material. We want that to be as representative of your sample as possible. And so we put many years into really optimizing uh, the focused ion beam technique for that. And so with that, why choose Eurofin ZAG? Well, there's several reasons, but I think it's important to state right at the top that client confidentiality is core to our business. We're a global leader for materials testing services with a broad range of instruments and expertise that leave us poised to take on even the most challenging materials and engineering related issues. At EAG, we have various certifications, accreditations, regulatory approvals and or licenses to support our different clients' needs. We can help solve your materials and engineering-related product problems. 